right? So it's very nice. And we got a room full of people. Uh, I'm so happy uh, to talk about the human factor in cybercrime and cybersecurity today. Um, I'm not going to name all of the presenters because they're on the slide and you will see them, but we have a variety of talks. I will start right away with a, an overview of what we've done on, in the past four years about cybercrime and cybersecurity within organizations. There are a number of people talking about cyber criminals, uh, people that are talking about victimization, interventions. So lots of interesting talks, uh, and I will keep it short um, because we have 11 presentations in uh, two hours. So uh, let me find this thing, see if it works. Yeah, thanks. Um, so up to the first presenter, which is me. I got geleugeld. Um, I just forgot, I, I need to go back. Of course, this is hosted at NSCR. Uh, the Hague University of Applied Sciences is also uh, collaborating uh, with University, which is right next door, and Saxon University are, are all involved here. And we've got a couple of PhD students who are also uh, at other universities, for example, Leiden University and Tilburg University. So we're done with calling all of the names. Uh, let's go to the first talk, um, which is basically much more of a teaser and not a real uh, talk about uh, research, because what I want to show you and I brought a book, but I forgot it. It's somewhere else. Uh, maybe I'll show it later and during one of the, the presentations. Oh, I see it here. The camera doesn't follow me. Uh, don't buy it because it's in Dutch, but uh, I'm going to give a presentation about this and you can see it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, but basically, this is the results of our four year research program into cybersecurity in organizations. Uh, so I'm just going to give you a brief overview of you know, all of the researches we've done, and I will highlight a couple of the interesting uh, results. If you want to learn more, here are a few of the references that you can have a look at later. As you can see, a number of them are in Dutch, and that's because we don't only do the academic research for the academic community, but we actually want to make an impact in society. So we also try to write a lot of Dutch reports for policymakers, decision makers, that actually hopefully are going to do something with all of the research we do. So we try to have a balance between traditional peer reviewed publications, com conferences like this, and trying to reach the, uh, yeah, reach the work uh, field in the Netherlands and, and outside. Um, so about the research uh, program, of course, anybody that knows our group or knows the, the people in the Netherlands uh, that are in this room, you know that we are all focusing on uh, the human factor in cybercrime and cybersecurity. So our research program also, you know, is all about the human factor. So we don't ignore the technical uh, uh, parts of cybercrime and cybersecurity, but we try to focus on either offenders, victims, or people that are working on tackling cybercrime. And the aim of this particular research program that we set up in 2017 is to increase the knowledge position of SMEs, small and medium enterprises, so basically almost all enterprises in, uh, in most countries, to increase the knowledge about cybercrime, cybersecurity, in order to reduce victimization amongst these companies or the impact that victimization has. And we have four pillars within our research program. The first being victimization, so what's going on, how often does it happen, stuff like that. Uh, but of course, as we are criminologists, we also think it's interesting to research what's going on when it comes to cybercrime against these organizations. What kind of attacks do they suffer from? What's the modus operandi? What can we learn from that in order to tackle uh, cybercrime or to better prevent uh, cybercrime from happening? The third line is a, is a very important one because although, of course, as criminologists, we try real hard to make sure that we understand criminals and we come up with interventions that help to prevent crime, we also know, you know, that's not going to solve the entire problem. So we also know that cyber incidents will remain to occur now and in the future. With the ongoing digitization, we even know that it will only increase. So we also focus a very large chunk of a research program on cyber resilience of organizations. So if you encounter an, an incident, what can you do to make sure that the damage is as limited as possible and you can be back up in business again as soon as possible? And the fourth line is, is a much broader line, which is about what can you in general do to tackle cybercrime? What can we learn from public private partnerships and stuff <laughs> like that? So off to the, uh, the first part of the research program, which is the first pillar, but it's also the, 
the fundament of this of this research program because when we started in 2017 there were almost no studies being done into cybercrime cybersecurity within small and medium enterprises so what we started to do with Raul who's sitting here I don't know if you can see him uh, but we actually started measuring we call it in the Netherlands zero measurement I don't know how to call it in English let's say we looked at the prevalence of uh, how, how often uh, organizations fell victim of a cyber attack and we tried to identify risk factors so that was basically the first research that we did just to try and figure out you know is this a big thing or not or should we you know stop this research program in a few years once we've learned enough the second one and this is an, an, a nice example of of um yeah how fast uh, uh cybercrime trends can go is we had a look at whatsapp fraud in the netherlands so simple frauds via whatsapp aimed at individuals individuals and business owners and we never thought about whatsapp fraud when we started the program because it was non-existing in 2017 but in 2019 and 2020 there was a rise and rise in all sorts of variants of, of frauds via whatsapp and there was a lot of media coverage but there was no academic research being done so what we did based on a, a representative sample of, of uh, uh, people in the netherlands we actually looked at how many people fell victim of WhatsApp fraud and looked at all sorts of other factors. So a nice example of you know, doing a, a research that's very relevant for society at that moment. What we're doing at the moment, we're trying to finish that with Steve, who is in the middle here in the green shirt. We're trying to finish a, a project into cyber risk and cyber victimization during the COVID pandemic, which you know is not over yet, but we happen to have uh, measurements on uh, one minute that's not possible we happen to have uh, a measurements on uh, cyber victimization on um, before COVID, and we have that after COVID, uh, during COVID, so we can see whether or not the trends are uh, changing or not um now this doesn't work anymore thank you very much <laughs> So the one thing that I want to share with you when, when we talk about victimization is that when we looked at all of the, uh, um, uh, the people that were in the survey, we found that one in five became a victim of uh, cyber crime with financial loss. So that's a very large part of the population. And it also shows you that it's not something that, you know, you just uh, can ignore or you can say, well, it's something that uh, organizations should do by themselves. It's really a big part of our economic growth, you know, is, is in danger because they are under attack. So I'm going to take a, a, a few more minutes to wrap it up just because I was introducing the section and you know, this takes a lot of time, but I will skip real quickly through these uh, first uh, a couple of slides. So uh, a lot of our research also focuses on cyber crimes. I'm not going to discuss that in depth because we don't have the time, but as you can see here, this year, we will have a number of relevant publications on insider threats, social engineering, and cyber criminal networks. And the most intriguing thing I always see is that when it comes to the, the low tech cyber attacks, so phishing, banking malware, and stuff like that, but also the WhatsApp frauds and other schemes, you see there is an intertwinement between cyber criminal networks that are very international and uh, uh, they are very locally embedded with traditional networks. So we're also setting up a new line of research, actually looking into how entwined they are and looking at possibilities for local governments to tackle this. As I said before, one of the biggest pillars, pillars was cyber resilience. So if you wanna learn more about that, we've done a, a number of studies, which I think one of the most important ones is on uh, supply chain cybersecurity, which will be bigger and bigger in the future and risk communication and i'm sure Remco will tell you all about that because this is something that we're doing a lot of uh, with his uh, crew and then i will move to the final slide and uh, finish this up within 30 seconds or so because what did we learn over the past four years not only that you know companies fell victim to cyber attacks a lot so there's no need in stopping this program we need to expand it actually but you also see that we need to move more and more towards cyber resilience and then meaning actually starting to measure actual behavior instead of what most psychologists tend to do not actual behavior but intention to behavior and stuff like that and do experimental research with interventions and stop with doing all of the we're testing pmt and stuff like that no just have a look at the practice 
do real field work over there and do experimental research. And the last thing I want to mention here, because there is lots of money going to governance, there is lots of uh, attention to cybersecurity governance, and it's very important. But it seems to me that a lot of the studies being done there are not empirically, they are theoretically. So I think we as criminologists, psychologists, have to add the empirical layer in there and make sure that what they do is actually founded on empirical studies. So that's it for me. I will give the floor to Yuri. He's going to jump over the table. No, it's not. And uh, Yuri will tell you something about unraveling uh, crime scripts of phishing networks. A very interesting study. Yuri, yes. the floor is yours. Yes, so uh, I'm Yuri. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the um, Hague University of Applied Sciences. Uh, and I will tell you something about the uh, crime scripts of phishing networks, uh, which is a study I did uh, together with Rutger. So the first question, uh, why do the study at all? So um, as shown in this graph, the uh, amount of unique phishing websites detected um, by the anti-phishing working group has been uh, increasing dramatically over the past uh, couple of years. Um, despite all the preventative measures being taken. So there is still a need for uh, new preventative measures uh, and maybe ones that are aimed at the different steps within the phishing process. Um, so a good way to design and implement um, effective intervention strategies is by using crime scripts. <coughs> and a crime script describes the different steps needed to take to uh, commit a crime from the preparation until the aftermath. So by using crime scripts, we can identify um, bottlenecks within the phishing process um, and tar then target those bottlenecks, disrupting uh, the process. So that was the main aim of the study, to develop a, a crime script of phishing, uh, specifically aimed at um, the theft of banking information, um, to identify bottlenecks within the process and to uh, design interventions aimed at those bottlenecks. We developed the crime script using data uh, gathered through uh, Dutch criminal court cases, uh, which we found at rechtspark.nl. And this is a website where Dutch courts uh, upload anonymized uh, court transcripts. We used uh, the search term phishing um, to identify um, potential cases, and we ended up with 93 eligible court transcripts. And that resulted in uh, 45 cases in total. And we then used thematic analysis to uh, analyze those cases. And we found uh, two crime scripts. The first one was aimed at the theft of ADM cards, while the second one was aimed at the theft of login details. Um, both crime scripts consist of three phases, um, the uh, preparation phase, the theft phase, and the cash withdrawal and money laundering phase. Uh, next, I will only talk about the second crime script. Um, because we found it in about, uh, in the most cases, in about 70% of cases. Um, and I will do that using an example. Uh, so our example case, uh, which was a real case, uh, took place in Amsterdam, uh, more specifically in a house in the southeast part of Amsterdam. So during the preparation phase, the uh, first step is to um, form a criminal group. Our criminal group consisted of uh, five people, um, who knew each other um, because of offline social ties. So they were either friends or neighbors or had a romantic relationship. When the group was formed, the next step was to uh, obtain uh, resources and specific services needed for the phishing attack. So they found email addresses of uh, potential uh, Dutch victims. They got a phishing website, which looked like the website of a large Dutch bank. They got spam software to send out all those phishing emails, and they found someone to call the victims, uh, which we'll talk about in a later step. Next, they also needed money mules. So a money mule is someone who lends his bank account uh, an ADM card to the criminals, and so the criminals can transfer money from the account of victims to uh, their account and thereby remaining anonymous. Um, and in our case, they did this by uh, approaching random people on the street and uh, asking them to uh, lend their ATM card in exchange for a few hundred euros. So um, when they've prepared for the theft, um, the next step is the actual uh, theft, so uh, the theft phase. So next, our criminals send out uh, phishing emails 
uh, two potential potential victims, which looked like um, emails that came from a large Dutch bank. And in those emails, um, it was stated that the victims needed to uh, order a new scanner, uh, which is a device that is needed for uh, internet banking. So uh, they could order this device by clicking on a link in the email. And once they've done that, we move on to the next step, which is the theft of personal information. So um, by clicking on this link, the victims um, got sent to a phishing website, which is a fraudulent website, but looks like the website of the large Dutch bank. And here they could fill out their uh, personal information, such as login details uh, of their bank account and phone number uh, to uh, order the uh, scanner. So once they've done that and they've sent the um, information, uh, our criminals got access to it. And we move on to the sixth step, which is the uh, obtainment of verification codes. So here in the Netherlands, to um, transfer money, you need the, need the login details of a, a bank account, but also verification codes to verify transfers. Um, and our criminals got this by calling the victims uh, using the phone number that they filled out in the phishing uh, website um, and saying, hey, uh, we're from the uh, large Dutch bank. We saw you uh, try to order a scanner and in uh, order to uh, complete this process, we need your verification codes. So now we have the verification codes and the login details. Um, and then we move on to the last phase, which is the cash withdrawal and money laundering phase. So using the login details uh, they got from the phishing website, our criminals logged into the bank accounts of victims and using the verification codes they got by calling victims, they transferred money to the accounts of money mules. Within a few minutes after the money was um, uh, transferred to the accounts of um, the money mules, it was uh, withdrawn in cash. And then um, it's ready to spend for, uh, yeah, for whatever they want. So usually electronics of expensive clothes. So that was the crime script uh, of the theft of um, banking information, if very short. Uh, I will now briefly explain the most important theoretical implication, which was that the most important steps within the crime script haven't changed over the past 10 years, which means that in interventions aimed at those steps will uh, still be um, effective for the next coming years. And lastly, the practical implications. So here we talk uh, about the uh, prevention strategies. So we identified two um, important steps within the crime script. So the first one is the uh, obtainment of resources, which can be made harder by, for example, uh, targeting um, online illegal marketplaces. So infiltrating them or shutting them down. And the second important step, which is the um, Recruitment of money mules uh, can be made harder by an awareness campaign targeting uh, potential money mules, telling them um, about the dangers of being uh, a, a money mule. And lastly, uh, we see that a lot of money mules are being recruited online. So um, online websites such as uh, Facebook or Instagram um, can monitor their users and, and take action when they uh, identify uh, an account which is actively recruiting money mules. On to the next one. Thank you, Yuri. I am just weird. I'm stupid and naive. I'm a pervert. I know I am. Um, I hope you all realize this is not a confession from me, but this is a collection of quotes I got from my research into the impact of financial extortion on adult males in the Netherlands. My name is uh, Raoul Monte. I'm a PhD candidate, a researcher at Tilburg University and the Hague University of Applied Sciences. And today we're going to talk about sextortion, which is, of course, a combination of the word sex and extortion. And it's basically the practice of forcing someone to do something, in these cases, sending money because it's financial extortion, by threatening to publish naked pictures of them. Why did we choose this, uh, this uh, topic? Because um, Online sexual abuse is often seen as a gendered form of crime in which females are the victim. But if we look at the broader empirical studies into this, we see that actually overall victimization, it says there is uh, also male and female almost equally divided. 
In order to get a, a deeper insight into the impact of this sort of victimization, uh, we chose a narrative approach and uh, we had interviews with six adult male victims. If you look at the linear consequent stages of sextortion, all sextortion cases had uh, these five stages. In the first stage, the contact stage, we see that the offender gets into contact with the victim via dating applications like Tinder or Happen, social media or websites that are designed to get in contact with people all over the world, like Yubo, uh, Omegle, Chatroulette, etc. The grooming phase is also on these platforms. And in the grooming phase, uh, trust is built between victim and offender by sharing pro uh, personal information. And also arousal and feelings of affection are created by uh, showing a lot of interest, uh, uh, using a lot of effective, effective words, uh, emojis, smileys, kisses. At the end of the grooming phase, when uh, enough trust and arousal is created, um, we enter the cyber sex stage. And in order to enter the cyber sex stage, the offender initiates a switch of platform to WhatsApp, Facebook, Skype, Snapchat. These are platforms that enable the exchange of media or that uh, allow uh, multiple people to engage in a video call. Uh, once both victim or offender are in contact on this new platform, the offender always initiates the cyber sex and uh, uh, she does that by uh, either sending videos of images uh, of herself naked and asking the victim to do the same, or starts a video call in which the offender starts to strip down and undress and ask the, the victim to do the same too. Victims uh, engage in cyber sex for two different reasons. The first one is that they are simply just aroused because of everything that happened before and they just go with it. Other victims indicate that they actually feel a bit overwhelmed uh, from what is happening and they don't want to, but they bring put under pressure by the offender saying, hey, I sent you this video, now you have to send something too. After all victims engage in cyber sex, the offender puts uh, a not, uh, more pressure on the victim to perform certain sexual acts that the, uh, the victim normally wouldn't, for example, uh, sodomy or other things. At this point, uh, the offender was able to capture enough uh, images by screenshot or screen, screen capturing of the cyber sex, and he continues to the next phase, which is the threat phase. In the threat phase, the offender provides proof of the cyber sex, what I said, by screenshot, screen recordings, and he also provides proof of that he is aware of what is the social circle of the victim. He distilled the social circle of the victim by looking at the contacts that the victim has on the different online platforms that have been used before. So he shows like a screenshot of the Facebook friend list. A other way uh, in which the offender does this is uh, use the personal information that was shared in the grooming phase, search it on Google, so then at that point, he can say to the victim, hey, look, I know who your colleagues are. Uh, I know who your family is. I got your images and I'm going to send them to them if you don't pay me money. The amount requested was uh, different between 200 euros or dollars or 2000. Uh, one of the victim, victims actually paid uh, payment was via money transfer. Uh, but this victim immediately noticed that paying doesn't stop the threat and was confronted with new threats. So in the end, all the victims ended up in the same ending and aftermath phase. In this ending and aftermath phase, the victims uh, decided, out of sheer panic, but we're going to talk about that later, to uh, remove all the social media profiles they had or put them on private so they are not visible at all online. And they blocked the offender on uh, all the platforms where they were in contact. Some victims, they uh, notice that the offender already made a friendship connection or send an image or video to somebody in their social circle. Uh, so at that point, what they did is they approached those people and said, hey, uh, you might have got like a weird message. Can you please remove it or ignore it? After taking all of these measures, the victim decides to like stick their head in the ground like an ostrich and go into isolation. So they've taken all these measures. They don't want to think about it anymore. They don't talk to anybody about this and they just hope that this will blow over and nothing will happen. Well, if you look at the emotional impact of this, what it does to the victim, and you see that obviously in the first three phases, contact, grooming, cyber sex, those are phases uh, which uh, give positive emotions. The victim is aroused, uh, he's being made bigger than he is, he's gonna think like, hey, this is a new person I met, I'm gonna have this 
really good experience with her. But then when confronted with the threat, they end up in a crisis situation. And the first response of the victim is that they get really angry. Like, who can, why, why are you doing this to me? How can you do this? And they try to fight it. What the offender does then is respond and apply extra pressure in three different ways. First of it is that he uses very strong words uh, that tell the victim like, hey, what's going to happen to you if this is exposed? And using strong words is like, hey, your world's going to be destroyed. Everybody's going to know. The second way is that um, they introduce uh, uh, very small time deadlines. So they introduce like a, a countdown clock saying like, hey, you have 10 minutes and then you see the clock time down. The last thing that they do is that they continuously send messages so like every second, every second. And this leads to like a, a shrinking of the headspace of the victim so that they can't think very clearly anymore. Victim indicate that this leads to very high levels of stress, fear and panic. Lastly, victims indicate that they feel powerless in this stage, and this mostly in relationship to the online platforms that were described before. <clears throat> because since the online platforms, platforms were the enablers of this, uh, this kind of crime, they try to approach these platforms, say, like, hey, can you block this user? Hey, can you take this offline? Once they notice that they will not get any help or response from the online platforms, and they feel that they cannot get any help of response from their social, like physical um, uh, circle, they feel powerless. In the ending and aftermath stage, uh, these really strong uh, emotions from in the threat phase, they change a bit to more long lasting emotional, which are um, uh, caused by other things. First of all, um, the discrepancy between the very good feelings and the idea that they have like something beautiful is going to happen and how it ended leads to feelings of guilt, like how, how could I have done this to myself? A feeling of shame, like maybe somebody will notice that I've done this to myself. Second, the intensity of all the uh, feelings in the crisis situation, once the dust clears, leads to feeling of, feeling of sadness because uh, it was just too much for them. Lastly, the fact that they are completely isolated aggravates all the, uh, 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 the emotional damage that they had because they have nobody to talk to and they have nobody to help them cope with what happened. So how do do victims cope with what happened? They change the meanings and the narratives about uh, what happened, but especially about themselves. And what you see is that they reconstruct their own identity in a way uh, in which they marginalize who they are. So that leads to the quotes where I started with, they cope with it by saying, I'm just weird, that's why it happened. I'm stupid and naive, that's why it happened. And I'm a pervert, I know I am, that's why this happened to me. So in conclusion, we can see that the narrative approach was useful for the study of impact. Uh, it's shown us that the impact transcends time and space in which it happens, and it can last for years and years, <laughs> because it was a cue for sense-making and reconstruction of their own uh, identity in a very negative way. Since we've seen that these victims are powerless and that they seem that they cannot get any help anywhere, they're damaged by the reconstruction of their own identity and they're isolated so they're not getting any support. We see that in uh, the aftermath of what happened to them, uh, uh, there's a cumulative impact of poly victimization on the victims, uh, which means basically is that they might drop out of school, they might quit their job uh, just because they feel so damaged. Thank you for your attention, and then we're going to go over to Steve. Yes. yes, thank you, Raul. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve van Rijer. I'm a senior researcher here at the NSCR, and today I'll present uh, one of our latest papers on the employment opportunities for applicants with cybercrime records, for which we conduct a field experiment. Because we know from criminological research that Criminals are often unemployed and also that the criminal record could hamper their ability to find a job. There are various reasons why that's the case, because compared to non-criminals, we know that uh, criminals have troubles getting a certificate of conduct, which is sometimes necessary to get a job. But also having a criminal record could give a negative signal to employees uh, because they might link that to inferior personal characteristics or they might consider uh, people with a criminal record as less trustworthy and maybe even um, afraid that uh, those people will victimize their company. Moreover, we know that uh, criminals more often have less human capital because they are 
in general, lower educated and might have less job experience. However, all previous studies focused only on traditional criminals. So we don't know yet whether this is also the case for cybercrime criminals. And there might be differences for various reasons, because uh, well, the same thing goes with cyber criminals that they might have troubles getting a certificate of conduct, which might lower their job opportunities. But on the other hand, having a cybercrime record could also give a positive signal because people might link that to as an, see that as an indication of people having important IT skills that might be helpful, especially within the IT sector. <laughs> Moreover, we know from previous research that cyber criminals have more human capital than traditional criminals. They are in general higher educated, have a higher intelligence, uh, and possibly also more job experience. So uh, we might expect there to be a difference between the traditional criminals and the cyber criminals in their uh, ability to get a job. So that's why we did an experiment in which we uh, examined whether cyber criminals, traditional criminals and non-criminals, whether there are differences in the extent that they are invited for job interviews. We also took into account ethnicity or migration background of people because previous studies have consistently shown that there is uh, discrimination against ethnic minorities in the labor market, which becomes very clear if you see this picture. If you look at the right, you can see that Dutch sex offenders were almost twice as likely to get invited for a job interview than non-Dutch non-offenders, which clearly shows uh, this discrimination. So in our experiment, we made uh, some fake profiles of fake applicants. Uh, they all had uh, exactly the same motivation letter, the same curriculum vitae, so uh, the same personal characteristics, same job experience, same educational background. There were only two differences. First one is criminal history, uh, one third of the applicants uh, was sentenced to community service for hacking. And they added uh, that this has taught them to cross the, not to cross the legal line again, and they want to be open about it and not to get into problems later in the application process. Another third of the applicants was sentenced for theft. So these are the traditional criminals. And another third did not mention this at all. So they are the non-criminals. That's the thing the difference is whether they mention a cyber crime, a traditional crime, or no crime at all. Second difference is the name of the applicants. Uh, three of them had a typical Dutch name, three others a typical Turkish name, because uh, the Turkish are one of the biggest migration groups uh, within the Netherlands. Uh, and this is <coughs> done to check whether there's also discrimination against ethnic minorities. And in total, we sent 300 fake applicants to real job um, openings. And we just, uh, within the IT sector in the Netherlands, and we just checked uh, which profile got the most positive responses. And the positive response in this case is someone gets uh, invited for an interview or the employee asks for more information uh, about the applicant. So here we see the results. As you can clearly see is that the cyber criminals and the non-criminals are almost equally likely to get invited for job interviews, which I think is a good news because it means that people with certain IT skills uh, still get a possibility to also use those skills for a good cause, even despite them being uh, convicted for cybercrime. On the other hand, we see the property criminals, they are much less likely to get invited uh, for a job interview. So this shows the difference how people with traditional crime and cybercrime are perceived by employees. Moreover, we again found evidence for uh, ethnic discrimination at the labor market. The people with the Dutch name were much more likely to get invited for job interviews than with the Turkish name. It is also visible in this picture. As you can see, um, let me see the Turkish non criminal on the right, uh, he's even less likely to get invited uh, to job interviews than a Dutch traditional criminal. So there's still um, <coughs> discrimination against ethnic minorities at the Dutch labor market. And uh, there was a lot. Uh, to win there, for example, by using anonymous uh, job application processes. This would uh, at least take away the first step of discrimination and give people the opportunity to go to interviews. So this was very quickly uh, our latest study. If you want to read the full article, it's just been published in Social Science Computer Review. These are all the authors, Anush Kapele, myself, Chantal van der Berg and Rutger Leukveld. And uh, well, most credits should go to Anush Kapele, she did all the hard work. I was just lucky enough to uh, present it today. Now I'll give the, uh, the floor to Asher. 
Thank you very much, Steve. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Asier. I am a postdoc at the NSCR and also at the Center of Expertise uh, Cybersecurity at the Haxe Hochschule. And today I'm going to talk about our latest research um, in which we try to evaluate the effects of online campaigns in the Dutch landscape on cybercrime, and in particular in the Dutch attacks. This, this project has been carried out together with uh, uh, Rutger Leukveld and Bauta Klinsson. And uh, just, just so that we get a feeling so that we know that we're on the same page, um, DDoS attacks are a type of cyber-dependent crime that aims at saturating uh, online services with coordinated massive amounts of internet traffic generally, uh, generally launched uh, by using botnets that have been infected with malware before, so that these services become unavailable to their legitimate users causing huge disruptions and sometimes loss of reputation and, and financial uh, costs. This is considered to be an entry level cybercrime, so it um, uh, can be carried out by um, juveniles fooling around with cybercrime or with early career cyber criminals. Um, and it's also being sold sometimes as a service, like in uh, schemes of cybercrime as a service, so that uh, even people with low to no IT skills um, uh, is able to launch DDoS attacks just uh, by paying a few a few euros, bucks, whatever. Um, so a little bit of background, a little bit of context. Uh, this project uh, started as an inspiration um, of the AdWords campaign launched in 2018-19 by the National Crime Agency in the UK, uh, in which they uh, advertised deterring messages in Google so that uh, youngsters that were looking for uh, keyboards related to DDoS attacks would um, see them displayed. And like messages such as, uh, for example, DDoS attacks are illegal under the criminal code and they have a penalty. And um, meanwhile, the research group at Cambridge was carrying out uh, research uh, using their infrastructure and data collected by themselves on evaluating the effects of police takedowns on markets for denial of service attacks. And they did, and they found out that um, actually this AdWords campaign might work on reducing the, uh, the amount of DDoS attacks they recorded. So the Dutch police, uh, interestingly, read the paper and also was in touch with some of the agents of the National Crime Agency and thought, hey, maybe this intervention is interesting uh, for us to carry out and maybe we want to do the same in the Netherlands. So why don't we just develop it in a way that we can actually evaluate it afterwards and determine whether it works or not. So they contacted um, us, uh, the NSCR, they contacted uh, Rutger, and they asked us if we wanted to join. And of course we said yes, uh, and started with them um, and developing and implementing several online campaigns with the in the same spirit as the, as the original one. So this is how we started with the uh, Google Ads project that consists of two phases. The first one, and the first one, we want to answer the question of uh, what is the best way of alerting consciences of these potential cyber offenders. And to do that, um, we show uh, several, we test the effect that several types of ads have on, on potential offenders, the way they engage with them, we determine uh, by taking a look at the clicks and the impressions they generate. And in the second phase, we actually want to determine whether these type of interventions actually work in reducing uh, DDoS attacks. So uh, in, the first, uh, in the first part, we ran a quasi experiment using Google Ads, and uh, these were the ads that we, that, we, that we show. And we use as a control group the uh, a translated version of the ad that the NCA used in their, in their design. And we actually found that social messages, so those that use consequences of behavior to invoke negative reinforcement for peers, might be a better alternative than the traditional deterrent message used by the police forces uh, worldwide. So now we want to, with, with the knowledge we gather in this research, now we want to test, uh, okay, now that we know what's the best way of communicating, engaging with potential cyber offenders, <coughs> does this intervention actually work to reduce these attacks? And this is what we're doing in this in this second stage as you can see the screen there are there, this, there is timeline starting in january 2021 and goes until may uh, 2022 and during all this time we developed four online ad campaigns that are represented by these green uh, sorry by these gray uh, rectangles uh, different time spans so they have different length and there are some periods in which no intervention was carried out 
So uh, we know from uh, talks with the police and also internet service providers that some uh, Dutch Jews actually target educational institutions and others of the types of institutions uh, with DDoS attacks, for example, during uh, times of exams. So we hypothesize that these campaigns we will have some effect, some reduction effects on the volume of DDoS attacks recorded by uh, IE internet service providers uh, that support educational institutions and also by general infrastructures. So what we're being busy, so what we've been busy doing until now is collecting data from different sources so that we can take a look at whether the DDoS trend reflected in those charts by this blue smooth line actually decreases during the campaigns, shortly after or in the long term. And now we, what we have to do uh, in, in, in the next months is actually carry out some analysis to determine uh, different types of effects and also to control for seasonality, which now we will be able to do because we accessed uh, um, the Cambridge data, which was the same that was used in the first original campaign. So that was it from my side. If you don't get to answer, to ask any questions, or we can't answer them in the chat uh, when the, our session finishes, feel free to drop an email or a tweet at these accounts. So next one, I think it's uh, Daniela, already here. Take it over. All right, so my name is Danielle Stiva, and I'm working on a project called uh, Follow the Honey. Uh, we are setting up Honey Gmail accounts, and we are linking them online uh, to be able to follow any activity uh, on them. And I'm working in collaboration uh, or under the supervision of uh, Stein Alter and uh, Valter Steinbank uh, in the NSCR. Uh, so we started doing this project following this method uh, by our local colleagues. Uh, they created Gmail accounts and they embedded hidden scripts in them and then they leaked them online and followed activity in the uh, in those accounts. We're going to do the same thing, uh, but in this time in this uh, using this method, we're going to um, manipulate uh, di different decision making factors so we can study decision uh, making in cybercrime. Uh, so we started with the rational choice perspective. This is just the basic perspective uh, of decision making uh, terminology at the moment. Um, we, uh, I'm not going to dwell into the details of it, but the, uh, the essence is that uh, people are less likely to offend under the fear of punishment and uh, they're more likely to offend if uh, there is more benefits than cost. So basically <coughs> cost benefit uh, uh, scale. Um, there's a lot of evidence to support this, but most of the evidence uh, is based on interviews and uh, hypothetical case scenario experiments, and it's very difficult to draw conclusions uh, that are um, causal because there's a lot of biases in interviews, the hindsight bias and hypothetical case scenarios. You have uh, the room, you have the experimenter sitting with you and asking you questions. Uh, so there, that all introduces a lot of biases into the answers. What we want to do is study crimes as it happens in vivo um, by uh, yeah, setting up honey accounts and uh, following the activity. So just the method that I described earlier, uh, we're going to start by looking at the factors that uh, help or influence people uh, to perform a crime, to the, in the decision to uh, commit the crime. Uh, so after we create the Gmail accounts and we embed the hidden script in them, uh, we will leak them online accompanied with some uh, message. In that message, we will either indicate a risk warning or a reward assurance to see if that influences their decision to enter the accounts. And then we will trace the activity of them. Uh, so the manipulation, uh, as you can see here, uh, the reward will either be assured in the way that uh, we say there will be some bank accounts associated with these accounts or not. And then we also manipulate the risk by implying that there will be that those accounts will monitor or not. Um, and then it's a two by two uh, design. And we hypothesize that reward assurance will increase uh, the likelihood of an account to be uh, hijacked and the risk warning will decrease the likelihood of an account to be hijacked. We also think that the accounts uh, that are more deemed more attractive will be uh, hijacked earlier than the accounts that are less attractive. And we are not sure about the interaction between these two. 
Um, yeah, so uh, we this is just uh, uh, set. It, this project is being set up at the moment, and we're still piloting it. Uh, and right now, I'm not having a lot of um, signal, so we're piloting to see on different platforms if anybody is picking up those accounts and entering them. And yeah, it's really difficult to see any kind of signal. So if anybody has an idea about uh, another type of honeypot. Uh, research that we can use for this design. I would love to hear it uh, and I'll enter my details later on. And uh, these are the references. And Susanna and Lady Mark, I think you're next. Yeah, thanks. So, good morning, everyone. Afternoon, evening, depending on where you are. Um, my name is Susanne van der Trochte Goede, and I'm here to talk to you about the SME Cyber Buddies project together with Eline, who will present uh, the final part of our presentation. Um, so we're talking today about the development and preliminary evaluation of this new intervention that is aimed at making SMEs more resilient toward ransomware and other cyber risks. Um, so we're doing this research together with Rutger uh, Leufeld and Hepco Spithoven. Oh. <laughs> we're back. Um, so just to uh, uh, detail where we're coming from, so we know the prevalence of cybercrime uh, is high, uh, particularly SMEs are often victimized. Uh, and one of the most common types of cybercrime that SMEs uh, face is ransomware. Um, based on uh, several studies, one of which uh, Rutger referred to in the beginning, um, we know that the cyber resilience of many of these SMEs is lacking. Um, and when I'm talking about cyber resilience, it's important to know that I'm not just referring to technical cyber resilience, but also talking about uh, the extent to which they have policy um, and the extent to which they um, uh, have a human factor approach towards cyber security. Finally, it's important to know that uh, cybersecurity has a local component in the sense that municipalities uh, feel uh, that they are somewhat responsible for providing help to SMEs in their uh, local surroundings. And uh, some of these municipalities uh, have uh, reached out to researchers in need of an intervention to help SMEs become more cyber resilient. So that's where this project came in. And in this presentation today, I want to talk about three things. First, the theory, then the intervention that was developed, and then finally, Elina will talk about the pilot that is happening right now. So first, the theory uh, that I uh, took out in two parts. So first, when I'm talking about cyber resilience, uh, what do I uh, actually mean? And what we've done is we've applied Holnagel's uh, phases of cyber resilience. Uh, that many of you might already know. Um, and we've uh, combined that with the COMB model from psychology um, to give new dimensions that can be measure measured. And just to explain what I'm talking about, here we see the four phases of Holnagel's cyber resilience. And according to this model, in order to be resilient, uh, companies need to anticipate cybercrime, but they also need to monitor, uh, respond, and learn from any uh, events that might happen. And when we combine that uh, with uh, the COMB model, which is short for capability, opportunity, and motivation, we see that if we apply this to the human factor of cybersecurity, uh, we get a, um, a, a table that we can fill up. Each, uh, each cell here can be filled up. And just to give you an example, if we want to measure the extent to which companies are able to monitor, um, for example, activity on their network, and we need to not only measure the technical side of that, but also focus on the human factor side of it and a divide between capability, opportunity, and motivation. So are they not only uh, able to know how to monitor, but also do they have research resources to monitor and are they willing to monitor? And then the second part of the theoretical framework, how do we actually achieve actual behavioral change? Um, and we're 
basing this on the cyber resilience model. And we've taken two of the aspects from this model that have proven to be important uh, to um, uh, that influence the um, intentions that SMEs have to take uh, uh, cybersecurity measurements. And two of these factors are social norm and effective response. Uh, the first basically means that we want to point SMEs towards the norm of other SME company in their neighborhood or, or in their same uh, area of expertise. And we want to show them what these other SMEs are already doing in terms of cybersecurity um, to get them to uh, also take more measurements. And the effective response points toward uh, making SMEs not only aware of the risk, but actually have them apply that to their own company and make them, uh, for example, worried about the possible risk, risk their own company is uh, facing. So the intervention that we've developed, the SME Cyber Buddy Intervention, this is basically uh, the steps that the intervention has. So first, uh, we have a buddy that is an IT student, for example, and they are linked to an SME. Um, and they uh, uh, go to the SME and they give, offer them a cyber scan. And in this scan, uh, we get to see the current status of the cyber resilience of this company in terms of their technical policy and human factor measures. Uh, and this is also the before measures. Um, then the body writes an advisory report, which is uh, tailored to the particular situation of this SME. Then the body provides on-site help. They come over for two days and they help with all sorts of uh, measurements that the uh, SME might uh, want to take, but might not be able to take. And then after seven weeks, they do uh, the cyber scan again, which is the after measurement, allowing us to say something about the effectiveness of the intervention. Currently, we're doing a pilot, and Elena will talk to you about this. Yes, so um, in this model, you can see, uh, firstly, in the left column, how we have directly approached the different SMEs. Uh, the SMEs also had the uh, possibility to approach the municipality themselves based on social media posts and uh, news releases. Um, as you can see, about 10% uh, of the SMEs who were approached directly choose to participate. So in the next column, you can see how many participants we had in total. Uh, of the ones who participated, about a quarter used the on-site help days, which were an optional part of the process. And we are currently in the step of the post measurements taking place. Um, so far, there hasn't been any fallout, and we've taken about half of the post measurements. A few things that we've uh, noticed during the process is, first of all, that it's been pretty difficult to be working together with SMEs. First of all, just finding SMEs who wanted to participate has been pretty hard. Um, of the ones who did participate, we also had some trouble collaborating. Firstly, because this project is just not their main priority at the moment. This is usually uh, due to busy schedules. It's very hard to link up with their bodies. And also they had a bit of a different expectation, a lower expectation of how much time they should invest than we did. We also noticed that the on-site help days weren't used as much as we expected them to, but we did see that when they were used, they were used for pretty big changes to such, such as policies, training, and achieving certificates such as ISO. We've also uh, talked to some involved parties on how they've experienced the project so far. So firstly, the bodies, they find it a very interesting product to be working on. They're gaining a lot of experience. They did find uh, writing the advisory report a bit tedious because it's a very repetitive thing to do for 10 times. Uh, then as for the SMEs, they, uh, we asked them how satisfied they were on a scale of one to five. And on average, they indicated a four, so that's pretty high. We also asked them if they would recommend uh, using this in different municipalities throughout the Netherlands, and 80% said yes. And as feedback we uh, received that the report is sometimes a bit too lengthy. Then as for the municipalities, they are really appreciative of the project, especially ones with limited time sources say that this is a very time efficient project for them. They also would like to use it in the future, uh, maybe in different municipalities. But they did say that if we do that, we should look at the recruitment of SMEs because that has been the most difficult part so far.
And just finally, to tell you something about the next steps that we're planning on taking after we've completed uh, this round of pilots, we're doing a second one. And then uh, when we have the full group of SMEs and the before and the after measurements, we want to do a small effect evaluation to see if the intervention actually uh, contributes to cyber resilience. We want to improve the intervention uh, and hopefully uh, if this proves to be an effective intervention, uh, roll it out in a, a national uh, way. Okay, thanks. Uh, Remco is up next. Thanks. <coughs> Great, I'll just stand here. Uh, why on earth did I include a picture of the Beagle Boys here? Uh, well, to be honest, it was a suggestion by my oldest son. He's 10 years old and a huge fan of Donald Duck. And I was talking with him about uh, how to make a lot of money these days, because everybody has to wants to have as much money as Uncle Scrooge has here. Um, and he told me, well, the best thing that you should do that is to go online and just get the money from everybody here. Just uh, a lot of deception and theft going on, those kind of things. So he was talking to me and I was thinking, well, well, my manipulation here really worked. Uh, and he manages to actually include this in his Donald Duck way of thinking. So the thing that we, we have here is uh, a huge problem uh, as a society, but also in the world that's called cybercrime. And we've had a lot of talks going on here uh, that, that you revolve around this, this problem and, and focus on several uh, elements of what we call cybercrime. And it, it indeed is a big problem. We see it as uh, one of the top five global threats at the moment and an estimated loss of $6 trillion in 2021, which is enormous. And the financial impact of cybercrime is at the moment estimated as as large or even bigger than the financial impact of global drug marketing. So we have an enormous problem here. And how can we turn this around? It's a question. And I think that we can learn more from the way actually offline crime dropped here. And there's a nice uh, uh, pack of literature here on the crime drop. The international crime drop is pretty good studied, if you ask me. And there are multiple hypotheses going around. Why did the offline crime actually drop? And there are like 24 uh, theories about that. Uh, some has to do with uh, uh, lower amounts of lead in the water, actually, so that the brains are not that uh, influenced by lead and leads to less uh, antisocial behavior. That's one of the more uh, freaky uh, theories, if you ask me, but the one that actually stood out with empirical testing was actually the security hypotheses. In other words, crime dropped, the offline crime dropped because people secured themselves more and security measures became actually the norm. And the question is, what can we learn from this? Uh, is actually that help, it helps to, to take preventive measures. It helps to make the security norms the way of acting and making it a standard. But the question is, hey, Luke. <laughs> the question is, how can we do this? It actually needs to be uh, considered that there's much more going on than just security measures uh, have been risen and uh, that it's more or less the standardization of security. There's something going on under the radar there. And it's something that I spoke with uh, the, the authors on, on the crime drop also, is that the, underneath the standardization of security measures, which led to the crime drop offline, you see a lot of elements going on there, like risen societal awareness. Where did that came from? Uh, risen technological measures that are uh, included here, uh, risen knowledge on how to prevent falling victim of crime and the spreading of that knowledge throughout the society, and also a risen willingness to, to change one's behavior uh, to avoid victimization, a, a risen willingness to pay for security, and risen social affluence so that we can actually pay for it. So there's actually a lot of going on. Uh, if you think about it, what can lead to the standardization of security measures here. And how can we get this to the online sector then? Uh, we see a lot of problems going on here. 
And uh, uh, Rutger already mentioned it, we do a lot of uh, risk communication research here and we design tailor-made messages for specific target audiences here. Uh, and it's actually very hard to get people to change their behavior and listen to the message that you want to get them to listen to because they have a huge optimistic bias. We think the risk is there of cybercrime and specific cybercrimes, we know that. But we all are programmed, we are wired in such a way that we think only other people will fall victim of crime. So we ignore the messages that are actually quite important to us. And it's not only the SMEs, but also uh, a specific target audience within the larger pro public, but for which we've seen that these, these target audiences have this reaction to, to these messages on risks. So how do you do this? Well, you actually need to, to get their attention and you need to provoke that attention. Uh, we use a lot of uh, uh, false advertising, uh, but also specific targeted uh, messages that align with the way the target audiences actually, uh, actually uh, reacts to it, the, how, they, how they think about this risk. And we, we actually try different ways of getting across that barrier uh, which is called uh, the optimistic bias. And the question how to do this is something that we are now studying more and more, uh, how to do it in an effective manner. But it's actually necessary if we look to other uh, uh, types of risk uh, uh, management, we see that the human factor can be a very, very uh, helpable uh, factor in dropping uh, risk. Here you see the amount of um, uh, aviation accidents over the years, and you see it dropping uh, by large, and you see that there's a lot of influence from the human factor here. And there's a lot of research being done uh, more in the safety area of uh, high risk organizations, those kind of uh, uh, um, uh, questions. Uh, organizations like uh, petrochemical installations, but also aviation, uh, have studied that the human factor is quite a, an influential uh, factor that we can uh, call on if we want to drop a risk. So this is very important that we should step towards this new way of, of looking at, at cybercrime already mentioned, the, the human factor part, safety two by uh, Eric Holnavel already mentioned, uh, by Susanne and explain uh, what steps are in there, it's necessary that we see that the human factor is a crucial part in, in the, the aspects we have in dropping online crime. So we need to have a, a, a security culture uh, more from reactive to proactive and the humans are actually the key element there that can help us. So what can we do? The to-do list here, is I think it's necessary that we have a public and private network actually more of a, a smart way, a fair way of approaching this with shared responsibility. And I see a lot of organizations, uh, municipalities, cybersecurity organizations, local governments, local police forces, everything, everybody is working on their own uh, turf and not really sharing this. How can we actually get towards the shared responsibility is a big question. And I think it's also a big question how to get to an ecosystem of shared responsibility within organizations instead of cybersecurity being the CISO's problem. Just cultures is something which we've learned from aviation and other human factor studies is a very large uh, element that can help us push this, uh, this, uh, this, this program. Uh, and it needs to be uh, studied how we can we get this just culture within organizations to report and really learn instead of just shaming and blaming, uh, sending test phishing mails to, to our personal and then what? Uh, how can we get this just culture and a safety to approach of cyber resilience in organizations and society? And therefore, I think it's necessary that we see that this human factor is the key for flexibility and resilience that we need. Uh, but we must treat them in that, that way first. So that is why, as um, uh, Jairo Gearloose here, um, this is something that we uh, experiment on with our partners, with other knowledge institutes here in the Netherlands and internationally. 
we are searching for ways to to work this uh, this idea further uh, and experiment with this and actually uh, work on this with public and private organizations together and push this agenda. So thanks for the attention. If you have any questions, feel free to drop me an email. And the next uh, speaker is Marco. <clears throat> Thanks. I'm going to put the chronometer for myself. Works. Yes. So I think I'm visible enough here. Yes. Good uh, afternoon for us, everybody. My name is Marco Romagna, and I'm a, a researcher at the Hague University of Applied Sciences, Center of Expertise Cybersecurity and PhD candidate at Leiden University. And this that I'm going to present right now is part of, uh, uh, it's part of my research, of my PhD research on, uh, on hacktivism. Now, uh, of course, I use Anonymous as picture because it's uh, probably the group that uh, pops up in the mind of everyone who knows something about activism. But it's actually a good link because uh, I've seen that many of the people that I interview uh, had a story related to it. So this, the, the idea behind this PhD was basically to understand what is activism, and there were already some studies, and to understand more and more why people engage with it. This is, as I said, the first part of the research. So as you can see from the title, we wanted to understand what are the motivations and the processes that prompt an individual to engage in, in activism. To do this, we thought to um, take an approach from more traditional studies on, uh, on social psychology, and we looked into the social identity model of collective action, which is actually a model that, as I said, is using social psychology and was used to study um, traditional street protests, basically. So what we thought was, well, does it apply also to people that are protesting online, so to, to what we call activists. Um, and as you can see here, the model that has, uh, went through some changes tells us that there are some moral values and the social identity that are central to the model. And they are the beginning of what will become the collective action, followed by uh, either the group based anger or what is called a perceiving justice or the group efficacy. So the fact that a group can bring a change. So these are the steps according to the model that um, develops into the uh, final collective action. Now what we did um, from a methodological perspective, we decided uh, to try to answer this question by interviewing people. So we had uh, uh, semi-structured uh, qualitative interviews. Uh, we managed to contact or to get in contact with 115 people, but only 30 of these, 26%, which is still quite good, decided to answer the questions. And as you can see also, um, we went, we used Twitter, uh, email accounts, Facebook and Telegram, but in the end, then the interview was done on a different, or not always, but sometimes on a different um, type of social media or, or, or channel, depending on what the respondents uh, wanted. And it went on more or less for, uh, for four years, from 2017 to 2021, uh, actually still going on because we are still collecting um, we keep collecting uh, uh, data. Uh, I also want to point out that uh, we selected specific people. So for activism here, we meant people that were uh, engaging in any forms of hacking or computer hacking, and they did it for a you know, social, political, or ideologically um, motivated approach, so to say. So don't think of people that just are, I don't know, retweeting or sharing things. That for us is not. Uh, activism. So there has to be the hacking component. And this is also the way we selected them. Hacking component, a social political motivation, and visibility, either using, you know, um, website defacement, social networks to promote their ideas, or, uh, um, or any way maybe they ended up uh, in the news, several groups uh, at this kind of uh, element that was uh, particularly important for them. So let's go into basically the results of uh, this research. I'm going to go uh, one by one. So the first one was morality. Morality was, um, was not a surprise for us, even though in the beginning the, the Simca model did not have morality as first element, but we realized, as also the author of the, of the, of the model, that is extremely important. 
Actually, um, in, in all the 28 interviews, we discover that people start engaging in, in, in activism, in this form of social protest, because they feel their moral values violated normally uh, by someone else. So there is a wrong way to do the things and the right way, as you can see. What we also discover is that we could divide the moral approach in sort of subcategories, basically. So the largest one was the fighting crime, evil, terrorism. So uh, in this case, 21 out of 28 respondents said that they engaged um, for this kind of activities. The second one was exposing the political or the elite misconduct, so the, the wrong actions of the ones that were considered wrong actions of a certain government in, in, 80, in, 20, in 18 out of 28 cases. Then we had a group that engaged in activism because of patriotism, uh, 9 out of 28 people. And finally, the small group was animal rights and, uh, and environment, only 5 out of 28 people. Unfortunately, I cannot go into details, but there were also some overlapping. So, for instance, we had people uh, that um, uh, engaged in patriotism, but were also interested in fighting crime, or people that were exposing political misconduct and were also supporting animal rights, and so on, <coughs> and, and, and so forth. So, there were different combinations. So, one thing that we realize is that normally, when people engage in activism, they do not focus only on one specific cause, but they have more different causes that they um, care about. Um, and this was uh, the, the first thing that we noticed. So morality is important, is the first step of, uh, of this uh, process. The second element that we look, uh, we take into account, of course, was social identity, which gives also the name to the whole, uh, um, to the whole model. And indeed, as it was predicted, social identity is particularly uh, important. And for the ones that are not familiar with the concept in social psychology is meant as the representation that a person has when belonging to a group. So how he feels about the group and the perception of himself as a member of the group. So as you can see here from the scheme, we have personal identity, we evolve into a social identity when we want to become part of the group and then the collective identity is the group identity. So how the whole group is represented to the people that are not part of the group. And social identity was uh, uh, indeed particularly important because it was present in uh, 26 out of 28 uh, of the respondents. So, so many people said that they felt the importance of identifying with a certain kind of group. And as you can see also here with, uh, in the quote, there is no doubt that sharing the values, morals and ideas plays a big role in my involvement especially where I'm participating in a specific op operation that we agreed on initiating, obviously, uh, with the group. There are more quotes in this, in, uh, in this sense, but the important thing was that, indeed, social identity is a bridge element between the morality part and then what becomes perceived injustice that we're going to discuss right now and also the, uh, the efficacy. So it seems to... Um, be in line with what was expected also, what was tested in, uh, in traditional forms of uh, activism. Um, the second element, uh, well, the third one in this case actually is perceived injustice. And basically here is the idea that people engage in the protest because they feel um, that they are angry about something. And indeed, anger and frustrations are the two main um, feelings that we see in this kind also in, in the interviews themselves sometimes they are really expressed in that way as you can see frustration is normally a pretty key uh, factor to act and um, this is collected uh, connected obviously to feelings of deprivation the sense of deprivation makes me aggressive sometimes also in this case while in social identity we have one block uh, that was quite unique um, in this case, like in morality, we were able to find some subcategories, basically, under the concept of perceiving justice. So people were acting either in uh, 16 out of 22 uh, cases in this, uh, in this case because uh, they were uh, disappointed by the political actions of a certain government or of a certain, uh, you know, political party. Uh, in 10 out of 22 uh, cases, they felt instead the need of acting because there were social disparities, and this was mm, what made them uh, 
sorry, in seven out of 22 cases, there were social disparities. And then uh, when there were problems with race, ethnicity, and even patriotism, so there were conflicts basically with other specific groups in, 20, in 10 out of 22 cases, people felt the need, uh, this anger, and therefore the need to uh, engage. If you notice, I said 22, because here we are looking into also um, we, do, we did two different things. We wanted to understand how often these elements were present in general and how often instead they were present in the first steps um, for a person to engage into activism. So uh, the, the things change a bit. Unfortunately, there's no time to go into details, but more will be obviously in, uh, in the paper. Uh, the third element that we took into account is perceived efficacy. And interestingly enough, only five out of 28 people said that perceived efficacy was the second step after the violation of their moral values to engage for the first time in activism. But uh, it's important to notice that all the respondents, 28, said that perceived efficacy was an element that in the end pushed them to the edge, so to say, to act. So they were all saying, yes, I decided to act because I thought I could change something in society, of course, for the good. As you can see here, with all the knowledge and skill that I gave over the years, I felt faster online to spread my message and show it and influence media to talk uh, about it. And it's important also to notice that many of the respondents said that uh, they felt much stronger when they became part of a group. So group efficacy was another important element in, uh, in, in, our, uh, well, in our paper, in our research, as also predicted by, um, by the Simca model. Now, uh, to close here, there is one thing that we thought it was different compared to the model. Um, we felt that instead of having two alternatives, as we've seen in the beginning, the process is much more linear. So there is a, it starts with a violation of moral values, is followed by normally a social identity, so the identification with a group of people that think the same way, so there is this bridge uh, function. Then there is a perceiving justice, but one thing that we notice is that social identity and perceiving justice can be basically they can change switch position one with the other and finally for sure is instead of perceived efficacy so there is a sort of rational approach uh, once you have a group or once you identify with the group once you are angry about something the last step is thinking okay with my hacking skills i can actually do something to change the situation so this was um to conclude it was um in line with what we uh, what was said also for traditional forms of social protest, it was in line with some of the research that was done in the past on activism, but we managed to put in new elements, particularly perceiving justice, perceiving efficacy, and then last, the importance also of hacking as a particular element that uh, plays its own role, basically, within the whole uh, process. So yeah, these are my contacts in case, and now it's time to have uh, Marley. So, hello everyone. Um, my name is Marleen Werdkranenborg. I'm an assistant professor at the VU University here in Amsterdam. I just heard I have plenty of time, but I won't bother you with too many details. Um, today I will be presenting a research report that we have published in January this year. Um, but I realized that I also uh, presented something about this report last year at the same conference. But it's the different part, different part of the report. So if you have been there yet last year, you've seen today, you know, you know everything about the report. Um, the report's about uh, cyber criminal behavior among young people in the Netherlands, and it's a longitudinal network study. Um, we started this study, uh, it was funded by the uh, UK Home Office because we don't have much knowledge on um, high risk young uh, people who may uh, commit cyber crimes. And especially, we don't know much about what is related to their behavior and how we can explain why some do positive stuff with their IT skills and others do negative stuff. Um, 
So we focused with our study on explanatory factors and we specifically also addressed the effect of peers. But that's what I presented last year. So this year I will present the rest. Uh, we will look at two different looked at two different types of cybercrime, so cyber dependent offenses and cyber enabled offenses. And um, we also included some uh, measures on traditional crimes so that we know um, to what extent we see different um, explanatory factors. So these are two questions that I will focus on today. The first question is to what extent do we see high prevalence of cyber dependent and cyber enabled delinquency in students that we think are at high risk of committing cyber crime. And these are in this case IT students. Um, and then secondly, we will look at individual and environmental factors that may be related to these two categories of cyber delinquent behavior. And I just heard that the presentations from last year are online. So if you're interested in the final two questions, you can either look at the report or at that presentation. Um, what we did for our study is we sampled high risk students. Um, and these were students in the Netherlands who were following education in a tertiary lower or lower education uh, schools. And um, we uh, eventually sampled 889 respondents um, in the first wave. And today I will talk about the results from the first wave. Um, and we um, also collected data in wave two and three. Wave three was in the COVID period. So unfortunately we had a large dropout. But nevertheless, very interesting data because we can compare their um, actions before COVID and after COVID. So there will definitely be a, a paper about that in the future. Um, but today I'll focus on the first wave of data. Um, we had a questionnaire of about 25 minutes, which included, of course, self-reported uh, delinquency, three different times, as I said, types, as I said. And we uh, measured many different individual environmental factors that might be related to their criminal behavior. Um, I'm not going to go into detail into all of these, but these are all, of course, based on previous research on traditional crime or previous research on cybercrime or things that may be related to cyber criminal behavior. With respect to the prevalence of cybercrime among this specific sample of high-risk youth, we saw that they were actually um, committing a lot of different cybercrimes. Um, and interestingly, also a lot more than traditional crimes. So as we see here, uh, many of them committed cyber dependent crimes, about half, um, 35 cyber enabled, 35% uh, cyber enabled crimes and 26% traditional crimes. And um, there's quite a big variation in the types of crimes that are committed. Of course, the more easy to commit crimes are um, more prevalent, but we also see, especially in this sample, um, the more technical types of cyber crimes, for example, um, writing malware is still committed by some of these youngsters, which pro probably reflects um, why they're also in IT education. Um, and we also see quite a large variation in how many crimes they commit, because that's the outcome variable that we use. We're not looking at do you commit a crime or not, because many of them commit crimes. But we are also looking at the variation of the types of crimes they commit. And you see that many don't commit any crimes, but a lot of them also commit a large variety of crimes. And there's also an overlap between the three categories. Then with respect to the individual and environmental factors, I just copy pasted the summary table from the um, report and I'm not going to go into detail into any uh, every uh, specific factor that's included here. If you want to see any of the details, just look at the report. But the one, I want to highlight a few major results on the individual and environmental factors. And I think for me, for myself, the most interesting result is that we see that positive behavior, positive cyber behavior is related to all three types of offending. And the first time we saw this result, we were a bit puzzled because that's not what you expect. But then on the other hand, these are students that are in IT education. So probably everybody around them knows that they know a lot about IT. So it's not a big deal that they help a lot of people with their IT skills. The question is, why do they also commit crimes? Um, so that's actually something we, I think, cannot go into detail right now or don't know the exact results about right now. But it's interesting to see that they actually 
um, are not as black and white as we think they are. And there might be a lot of opportunities to um, stir them in a the good way and make sure that they start using their skills only for the positive side. Um, and ways to do that are different, I think, between the different types of um, crime. Because what we see for cyber dependent crime is that there aren't many environmental factors related to this type of behavior. Actually, we found none. None of the environmental factors, so none, um, none of the online rules or offline rules or situations created by parents or school were related to this type of offending, which makes it difficult, I think, to do something about it because you cannot just change the rules. Um, but on the other hand, we know that these students also have um, a, a, a drive to, to learn more, and they were actually uh, very interested in um, a lot of things that were going on at school. So um, it's interesting to see if we can see if we can look at these students further and see how we can um, stimulate their positive behavior. For the other types of crime, these cyber enabled crimes, we can actually see that we can change this behavior by using environmental factors. Um, for example, by decreasing the time they spend alone at home with no supervision. Um, and also, for example, by talking to them at school. Um, so I think these, um, these factors show that for cyber dependent delinquency, it's quite difficult to influence it. But cyber enabled delinquency is just like many other studies have found more similar to traditional delinquency and we can have an impact on it. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not going to take too much time uh, here, but <laughs> um, I think this, this research, of course, this is only data based on the first wave. So we're going to do a lot more analysis based on the other waves. Um, but I think this research shows that first of all, a substantial proportion of IT students is involved in cyber delinquency which means that this is a group that we need to focus on if we're looking at prevention measures. Um, we need to look at different types of high risk populations. Um, and we see that we actually have opportunities to steer them away from the negative side to the positive side of cyber um, behavior. And um, for cyber uh, delinquency, it's important to see that we have low self-control and computer addictions as potential angles to um, target uh, them and to see if we can use that to reduce their cyber delinquency. Um, and for cyber enabled uh, delinquency, we can look at school factors and parent factors that might help to decrease this type of offending. Um, and I think also schools can play an important role here to help parents to reduce this type of behavior, because I think many parents might not might not know what to do about it or might not even know that they're um, children are doing these things. So I think this might just be a teaser to uh, to look at this uh, this report or at studies that we will do with this data in the future. Um, of course, we're going to use the longitudinal um, data that we have in this uh, in this research set. And um, we have already used that for the uh, social network part, but not for changes in online activities, for example. So we're definitely going to do that. We're also going to do some analysis on cyber delinquency during the COVID period um, and compare that to the period before. And um, my personal favorite in, 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 these, uh, in, in these results is that link with positive behavior. So we're going to see to what extent we can explain who from the people that are doing positive things with their skills, who is going to do the negative things and who is not. So that's uh, in the future avenue. Um, that we will look at, and uh, that's it. Next one is Luke. Yes, hello everyone. Um, I think I'll be uh, finishing up this panel uh, today. Uh, my name is Luke Beckers, um, and uh, I'll be presenting a paper of uh, Rutger Leufeld and myself. Um, this is the first paper for my PhD. Um, it has currently been uh, been accepted by a journal, but not yet published. Um, and it is about the online recruitment of uh, money mules. So money mules are individuals that provide their uh, bank accounts to uh, cyber criminal networks. Uh, criminals use this bank account to uh, hide uh, the money they stole from all different kinds of, of cyber crime, such as uh, phishing and, and uh, ransomware. Um, so if there weren't for money mules, um, law enforcement would be able to, to track down the, the actual perpetrators of uh, cybercrime uh, more easily. Um, uh, and because of this, uh, money mules are 
are really key um, in the execution of, uh, of cybercrime. So it's therefore very important to, to gain a thorough understanding of uh, how and, and why money mules are, uh, are recruited, uh, because then we can identify specific points of intervention uh, to prevent that uh, individuals become involved in, in cybercrime um, and thereby intervening with the, with the crime scripts of, um, uh, of various types of, uh, of cybercrime. So we know from, um, uh, from existing literature that there are certain um, uh, mechanisms in the uh, offline world um, that lead to the involvement into uh, cybercrime. Uh, we see, for instance, that uh, money mules tend to look up to the, to the luxury lifestyle of criminals. Um, criminals ride uh, expensive cars, they, they own uh, expensive clothes, um, and that's something that money mules uh, desire for themselves. So they're participating in fraudulent activities for, for a financial compensation. Um, secondly, we see that, that the behavior of money mules is normalized within their uh, social environment. Um, there is a, a subculture in which it's uh, accepted to, to participate in fraud. Um, uh, the group thinks it, it is okay, so, so I think uh, it's okay. Um, and finally, we see that uh, money mules tend to apply uh, neutralization techniques um, uh, with which they make excuses for or, or justify um, their illegal uh, behavior, um, claiming, for instance, that there are no true victims or that it's people's own uh, responsibility to, to protect their money. So while, while the offline world is still very important for the, for the formation of, um, of cyber criminal networks and, and the recruitment of, of money mules specifically, we see that the online environment is gaining uh, momentum. Um, social media platforms such as Instagram, but also uh, Telegram and, and Snapchat, um, they are full with, uh, with messages, with advertisements, if you will, um, of criminals that aim to recruit uh, potential money mules. So the goal of our study was to, uh, to examine which uh, techniques criminals use to convince people to hand over their bank accounts. Um, or in other words, are the, the same involvement mechanisms present online um, as they are offline? Uh, so to this end, we analyzed uh, 43 different Dutch Instagram accounts that are likely used to recruit money mules. And I'd say likely because, of course, we we're not in touch with the actual account holder, so we can be uh, certain that, that it's actually uh, being used to recruit money mules. Um, but we used certain, certain criteria by which we try to ensure as much as possible that the account is indeed relevant for, uh, for the purpose of, of our study. So for instance, we wanted to see at least uh, one reference to, to a bank card or, or bank account um, on the Instagram account. Now, to analyze these accounts, we chose to use a uh, theory-driven approach in which we used literature on offline recruitment as the framework for, for our analysis. So in other words, we, we tested the degree to which the, the, the offline involvement mechanisms that I just mentioned were also present uh, online. Um, and if maybe there are other techniques that criminals use that were um, unknown uh, before. So in general, we found that um, that criminals um, really vary in, in the way they present themselves. Um, some accounts um, uh, use uh, lots of text, have, have a lot of images that, that they've posted, uh, while other, account, uh, other accounts only have one sentence in, in, in their account. Um, uh, some have a very professional appearance, while others contain lots of slang. Um, but despite this variety, we see that all three uh, involvement mechanisms from the offline world were also present on the Instagram accounts. Um, and that those three uh, mechanisms were sufficient to cover all the techniques that, that criminals use. Um, so we see that especially um, uh, promoting a luxury lifestyle was, was present. So most accounts seem to be revolved around uh, earning money and, and gaining status among, uh, among peers. Uh, for instance, uh, recruiters post uh, images of money, like you see in this example. Um, um, or they claim that you can earn lots of money or, or fast money or, or easy money um, when you contact the, uh, the account holder. Um, the normalization of money mailing was also relatively prevalent. Um, we see, for instance, that recruiters claim that others already did it before you. Um, and they tend to show uh, images of uh, bank account overviews of, uh, of previous money mules in which it's shown that it, it actually works and that there's money to be made. Um, besides these two, we found 
fewer evidence of uh, neutralization techniques. So there are only a handful of accounts that were um, uh, claiming things like it's, it's legal to participate and it's risk free to participate. Um, so this implies that it's generally uh, known among the target group that um, um, that giving up your bank account may be illegal, um, but that they're taking the consequences for granted or, or maybe not knowing uh, what those consequences uh, might be. So another um, important observation that we made is that um, a few accounts are uh, actively recruiting. Um, uh, most of them only had one image posted since, the, uh, since all of the years they were active, um, even the, the accounts with the largest amount of followers. So it seems that it's not necessary for uh, recruiters to, uh, to proactively reach out to the, to the target group um, and that, that the money mules seem to find a way uh, to the recruiters instead. Um, and also relevant, I think, is that most accounts contained um, uh, references to specific areas or, or zip codes in the Netherlands, um, which implies the presence of uh, locally oriented cyber criminal networks, which now operate uh, online. So finally, based on our findings, we can identify specific uh, situational crime prevention measures to, to prevent that, um, uh, that people become involved in cyber crime um, uh, via such uh, Instagram accounts. Uh, for instance, uh, because most accounts seem to promote a luxury lifestyle um, um, uh, and this provokes individuals to become involved in cybercrime, it may be necessary to, to neutralize such peer pressure um, and set uh, pro-social norms about earning money. For instance, by redirecting the target group to, to organizations that can help with finding uh, a legitimate uh, job. And finally, we also recommend to, to alert conscience, um, uh, firstly about the risks of money mulling uh, for the money mules, uh, money mules themselves, but also about the, the emotional and, and financial impact of cybercrime on its victims, um, and that, that money mules are really contributing to this, to this distress. Um, even though that some money mules may be considered uh, victims um, for themselves. And um, that's it for me. Thank you for listening. All right, thanks, Luke. Let us check if there are any questions. Yeah, and we need to figure out to whom these questions were directed, of course. A general question, has cybercrime changed in a noticeable way over the past four years? Yeah, four years. I don't know why this is so specific in four years. <laughs> Let me take a first step, and if anybody wants to uh, add to that or correct me, then uh, let's do that. Um, personally, I don't think so. I've been involved in studying cybercrime for 15 years now, and we see although ransomware has gone up in comparison to 15 years ago, a lot of the, the, the crimes are still the same. And Currently, we're doing an analysis together with uh, Oxford University to look at a number of cases from 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago and now. And we see that the modus operandi is not changing that much, even when you talk about ransomware, even when you talk, talk about phishing and stuff like that. What we do see, of course, is what I call pop-up cyber crimes, just like the, the WhatsApp schemes that I, I, I told about in the first presentation, which is completely new. Nobody's doing it. All of a sudden, it seems to be working, and other groups are copying it. And it, yeah, it's a, it's a pop-up variant, and it it grows big really fast. But it's not really new. It's just using a new uh, medium to to uh, uh, to uh, actually commit these crimes. So I think the thing that everybody's always saying was well, cybercrime is changing so quickly, and that's that's why the police is not able to catch up. That's not true at all. If you look at the crime scripts or the modus operandi, only a few things change. Well, everybody agrees, or uh, is this total nonsense? And do you want to add something to this answer? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that was the first question or the first answer. I just wonder maybe Yuri can uh, answer about the question. Yuri, is there any aspect of phishing that is required for it to be effective? And can we target that for prevention measures? So is there a very crucial step within the process that is really, you really need to focus on that? Or are, are 
or was the steps as important? I don't know if you yeah. talk loud and everybody can hear you on this. But... <coughs> I've never done this before, so just uh... um, so yeah, some steps are more important than the other steps, um, and some steps are easier to target than the other steps. Um, so as I mentioned in the presentation, I think the two most important steps are um, obtaining the uh, uh, resources needed for the phishing tag. Uh, and the reason why we chose that one is because, um, well, in order to get personal information, you most of the time need a phishing website. Um, and without a phishing website, you can get personal information. And without personal information, you can't access bank accounts. So that's a very important one. Um, the problem, however, is that it's extremely hard to, to target this. Um, we've seen the Dutch police um, target uh, online illegal marketplaces uh, like Hansa Market. Um, and while that is effective for a very short period, uh, the criminals usually migrate to something else. So what we now see is Telegram being used more to uh, um, spread these uh, kind of uh, resources, maybe not specifically phishing websites, but uh, contact information of uh, potential victims. So um, while I think it is necessary to target that specific step, um, the only targeting that step won't work. Um, the other one is also, of course, important, uh, recruiting money mules. Um, so without money mules, of, like Luke uh, mentioned uh, just now, the most important uh, thing about money mules is that criminals um, can remain anonymous. Um, so if we try to uh, disrupt this step and thereby uh, preventing criminals from recruiting money mules and using their accounts, they have no way of um, laundering the money um, they get from victims. And the only thing they can do is transfer the money to their own bank accounts. But that's, of course, uh, uh, very easy to track for banks. Um, so in the end, I don't think there is one specific step we can target uh, uh, to disrupt the whole phishing process. Uh, um, I think it's better and more effective to target everything. And of course, being realistic, um, interventions will never solve or never disrupt one step enough to uh, um, get rid of phishing. So we can target a recruitment of money mules but there will always be money mules and we can target uh, the obtainment of resources, but there will always be ways to get resources. So in the end, I think targeting multiple steps will um, be the most effective. Um, and that's of course what we already see now, uh, police targeting uh, markets. We see um, spam filters um, preventing phishing emails from uh, getting in your uh, inbox. Uh, we see awareness campaigns for money meals. Um, uh, we see uh, on the internet the um, web browsers alerting you if you uh, are on a potential phishing website. So in the end, I think all those measures combined will be the most effective and there won't be one specific step. Uh, we can disrupt enough to get rid of phishing. Yeah, all right. that was my answer. Thanks. Uh, I totally agree. Does anybody here disagree? No? Good, thanks. I actually think that money mules are the most important step, by the way, in the phishing committing process. Because when we looked at phishing 10 years ago and malware came up, everybody was thinking, wow, now we have a huge problem. Well, the malware attacks are automated and you can monitor that very good. The phishing attacks are way more tailored. It's, it's very hard to actually you know, get your hands uh, behind it as a bank. While the, the process of getting money mules is the most important one for the criminals because they want to get the money. They can affect a lot of, of uh, bank accounts. They can get their hands on a lot of money, but the biggest problem for them is getting the money to themselves. So if we tackle that problem first, I think that, that will be a very a good first step. And of course you need to do other stuff too. Well, that's it for us in the Netherlands. Uh, I hope all of you enjoyed this session. Uh, I, uh, I really did. First time with such a large group uh, together in, in one room talking about cybercrime. 
We are all invited to come to Spain for Eurocrim uh, in September, of course. I think we have about 60 or 70 cybercrime presentations. So if you don't be there, you know, it's, uh, it's a shame. Uh, for now, I'm going to say goodbye. Thanks for everybody here in the room for, uh, for giving the talks. Thanks for everybody that's listening now or later on. If you're looking at this presentation and it's not 2022, but it's you know in the future, again, still feel free to contact, contact us because we will all still be working on all of these uh, studies. That's it for us. Thanks, everybody. Uh, have a good day and have a good conference.